So, one of my most fondest memories of dance hall actually happened when I was about seven or eight. It didn't happen within the urban backdrop of, of Kingston. Actually, it happened in a tiny town called Stewart Town in Trelawney, where my mommy was from. Me and my two uncles and my much older male cousin, we ventured to the crossroads of the town to take in a street dance. And then, back then, at that time, the Della Move was the dance that was in the I'm taking my common entrance from Holy Childhood Prep. I then went on to the Convent of Mercy Academy Alpha. That's me in the middle. <laughs> and, you know, um, Alpha had a mixed group of young women, both from uptown and downtown communities. And it was dance hall as a mutual interest that brought that social divide. To me, as a young teen, dance hall was exciting. It was raw, a real you. And most importantly, it definitely was not uptown. I was always in the thick of things, me and my friends. We were interested in keeping up with the latest feuds, the latest fashion, the latest dances, and the latest songs. And one of the feuds that we always used to argue about was what was going on between Beanie Man and Bounty Killer. I was a huge Bounty Killer fan, and I collected all things Bounty Killer. I had a folder dedicated just to him. I still have that folder to this day. You couldn't tell me nothing about him. And in my folder, I have an autograph that, from Bounty Killer that says, to Ebony with two Bs, enough love and respect. So, in about the 1990s, American hip-hop and um, rap culture begin, began to influence campy dance hall fashion. So, cargo chains and the oversized clothing was the fashion of the day. And if a nana wear a biggie, your nana occur straight. But then, in about the, the mid-1990s, that Jamaican designers then began to take a back seat to European and American designs. So clothing done by Tommy Hilfiger, Versace and the like were the clothing of choice. I can remember at that time too, if you were male and you were wearing clothing that was supposedly fitting, you came under heavy scrutiny. And I can remember Bounty Killer when he had taken on his signature black attire wearing his bootcut pants, was then always getting flack for wearing tight pants or what was considered then to be tight pants. Now fast forward in the same space, we all now have young men shopping downtown for women's clothing. Not only changing the shift in terms of the make, in terms of the fit, we're now having men exploring the other colorful spectrum that was associated with the feminine. That's really interesting to me, that there's this big shift. And, you know, if you were outside of dancehall space, these things would have been considered homosexual stereotypes at that time. It's important to note that metrosexuality, a term that also became increasingly popular, had men reconsidering their appearance. So there was a kind of manicuring that wasn't happening before, things that would have been associated with the feminine that was now being taken on by the masculine. So the fitted clothing, the shift in the colors, the bleaching of the skin, the shaping of the eyebrows, all of these things at one point or another would have been associated with the feminine. In fact, bleaching has always had a place in dancehall space and it was primarily practiced amongst um, females in that space and it was interesting to see now men taking that on. Now if you were outside of dancehall space, please note I said earlier, you would have been typecasted as being stereotypically homosexual. But within dancehall space, we could consider this as being camp. A term that Susan Sontag has described as artifice, playfulness, exaggeration, kitsch theatrics. It sounds like dancehall to me. So this campy fashion is something that was popularized first by dancers. It was kind of seen as the dancer's uniform. And, and so it was, it was kind of interesting now to see that becoming popular and becoming more mainstream and more acceptable. 
So I explored a lot of these, um, these facades, the changing in the physical appearance of the men in, my, um, earlier, in the earlier end of my um, body of work called Gangsters for Life. And I explored these through several paintings, two of which are behind us on the screen. So at the time, I had a, a childhood friend of mine who was also practicing bleaching, and he had walked with a whole bunch of other guys who were doing the same. And so I, I, in having a chat with them, I said, so um, you yeah, bleach. You know, for instance, people think, say, you're yeah, mama, man. You had an answer. And then he proudly shrugged his shoulders and said, no, man, it's a gangster thing. So now we see that the machismo is beginning to take on a different kind of exterior. The bleaching now was being seen as, as now a masculine badge. And that, I thought, was interesting. It was no longer taking on the context that it would have in relationship to colorism, which would have been associated with the colonial period. No, it was being likened to fashion. Your pants and your skin sat in the same kind of place. So I asked them both if I could do um, a photo shoot with them both. And eventually I used those photos to do a project that was called Bullets and Shells. I got back. Bullets and Shells from the Gangsters for Life series. In the Bullets and Shells installation, there are three photographs of these young men, singular and then together. And in Bullets and Shells, I was attempting to examine a kind of full feminine aesthetic that was now coming to the forefront with the machismo. And this was then juxtaposed with other female archetypes. So the wallpapering of the space, use of flowers and then also there's a symbol that's in those circular forms which is the fish and the fish has a kind of double context in our culture we know that the fish on one end is a term that is used um, for homosexuals but then on the other end the fish is also a feminine term and in jamaica we like to talk about how the vagina fishy then on the floor, sprinkled was um, several um, tampons, which I call pussy bullets. As if we ever look at the applicator shapes of a tampon, it's very much shaped like a bullet, sprayed to look like a masculine object, which is a bullet. So after doing the installation, it then caused me to reconsider what I was doing with the paintings. And as the project began to evolve, so did the imagery become more, um, become more camp, it became more colorful, it became more shiny, more decorative. And essentially what I was doing was use, using the masculine as a, um, as a structure, but using the feminine to measure that. So hanging feminine, supposed fe feminine archetypes on top of masculine um, imagery. As I continue to play with the imagery, as I continue to play with the imagery, I then also began a second photo um, project. Now this project, I, I'm always interested in finding a way to confront my audience. This project did not take place within the confines of a traditional art space. I thought it was important for me to take the images which were from the streets and put it back into the streets. The project um, was not done in color, but rather in black and white, but still had the obvious alterations. Later on, the project was shown with a gallery in color. So I, we pasted several of these images throughout downtown Kingston. And as me and my team worked, several people kept asking, how would them people eh? Them dead? Beg your one now? And because, you know, we were, what we were doing was illegal, we had to keep it moving, and we didn't want Desmond and his team to come and catch us. So we just gave vague responses and kept it moving. About two weeks later after the project was done, somehow a rumor had begun to stir in, that in, in one of the communities that was downtown. You see, when the project was done between October and November, there were a whole string of serial rapes happening in Kingston and St. Andrew. And somehow the members of the community began to understand the kind of mugshot context 
which I was using. I was very surprised by this because mugshots are not something that are shown publicly in Jamaica at all. It's not something that happens in public space. So immediately, apparently, these people started spreading the rumors that they were, these were the young men who were carrying out the rapes. Now, I was quite startled because these were young men who I knew from them, yeah, they had them knee. They were actually a part of a art program that I used to participate in. So I taught them um, for a very long time. And they were also street dancers who had a growing reputation in downtown. So I thought the most that would happen for them from these images is that they would be piloted to a new level of stardom. So what this project taught me is, one, that the, you know, that the, the power of an image, you can never underestimate. But then two, never underestimate the perceptiveness of your audience. Which brings me to um, my other project, which I call Iconic Recontextualizations. So there are several works that are in the national collection that I began to consider um, that were associated with the nationalist art movement. On the right, what you're looking at is Barrington Watson's Conversations, which was done in the 1970s. And on the left, you're looking at an image from a photo shoot that I did, which was a re-examination of Watson's um, Conversations. Watson is an important painter of his time. And um, what I thought was, was important about taking a work like this, um, I was interested in reconsidering what was now being understood as um, urban space and how the gender operation had changed within that urban space. So here it is, we see Watson's generation, the women are still occupying the street side. But in my generation, the women are absent because they're out at work. And now we see the men outside inhabiting the street corners. I see the street corner as an extension of domestic space. So it still sits in, like, in, in the feminine conversation. So here we have these men dressed in oh-so-clean dancer camp dandy outfits and well-blinged skins. So for several months, I kind of hesitated about how I wanted to present this project. I wasn't quite sure. Most of my photo-based projects at this time were always presented on paper and then masked with other things. And then in December of 2009, I was invited to participate in an alternative biennale called the Ghetto Biennale in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, a place that I would strongly encourage a lot of everybody to go to. It kind of revolutionized the way I was approaching my own work, but it's, it's a really interesting place. I've never been anywhere like it before. So when I went to Haiti, I then um, um, I did a project that examined voodoo um, gender roles within voodoo culture, but then it also allowed me an opportunity to play with notions about ritual and ceremony as it related to that culture. So I did this very elaborate installation, um, which you're seeing a detail here of, with a few of the objects that I had gone and embellished. Well, when you're in Haiti, one of the things that you notice about voodoo is how um, voodoo objects is how embellished they are. So, um, how embellished they are. So I realized that I wasn't doing enough with my own objects at the time. So when I left Haiti, I decided then um, that I would do these photo tapestries. So the images are actually now woven into the fabric and embellished with rhinestones, glitter, and other embellishments. So here we have conversations, which you had seen earlier, an image of from the photo shoot of, as a final project. And here's the detail. And then I also recontextualized Watson's mother and child to reflect daddy and youths. I looked at Albert Huey's counting lesson and recont uh, recontextualized that to sue my money, ha <laughs> ha. And then I also looked at Don Scott's um, cultural object, which looked at the infrastructure of garrison communities. And I decided to look at the other end of um, garrison communities that participate in dance hall and did cultural soliloquy. One, this is an actual car and cultural soliloquy too. 
and both blared um, popular songs from last summer. So after doing the, um, the singular project, um, singular figure projects, I then had this huge fantasy about, about doing these family portraits with dance hall signage. I was interested in looking at, um, looking at how the Don or the Dads kind of operated within that garrison context. So here is Entourage and the clip de Tivoli Homage from the family series. So after you do a couple rugs, you build a couple cars, the question is, what do you do next? Well, I built a church. And so here we have Christ and Company, which was recently featured at the National Gallery's Vienna. And so the actual song is a recontextualization of the Vibes Cartel song, Clarks, which was popular last summer, made to sound like a church song. And so then the question is, where is Ebony now? Which then brings to me to my next project, which I call Out and Bad. So now I'm removing the imagery and finding a way now to play with clothing, to play with objects as a way to talk about the notions of gender. Now that the physical self is absent and the clothes stands in, what does that then tell us? about the ideas that we have structured around what is masculine and what is feminine. As I continue to challenge my audience about its perceptions about gender and culture, I also want you to also think about, instead of asking, why is it? Ask, why isn't it? Thank you very much. <laughs>